this week in WWE was certainly a wild one, folks. It was a wild one. Mostly in the community. Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff were named new executive directors of Monday Night Raw, SmackDown Live, which in my eyes is a great move. There's no doubt about it. This is the move that WWE needed to make. This move shows desperately that change was needed and a new set of eyes and ideas in what is just a boring, bland, and stale TV product on a weekly basis. It shows all of that. You know it, I know it, there's no hiding the fact that Monday Night Raw is just cringeworthy, god-awful, terrible television that has been written by the same guy for 26 plus years. It also signifies two very important things that people are afraid to admit because those who took such a firm stance on it are now hiding. You're somehow hiding now, silent, knowing that you were wrong all this time. These moves signify that the company is finally admitting that the shows are garbage because if they weren't, a change this big in the form of Heyman and Bischoff would not have been executed. And I believe if all elite wrestling was not a factor in the landscape of the business today like it is, Vince McMahon would have never gone out and acquired the services of two men who tried to actively compete with his company for help against another company trying to step foot in Vince McMahon's backyard. In a complete non-quality of TV aspect, the WWE stock has fallen from April 23rd at $99.25 a share. That is from WrestleMania month. And now we currently sit with the stock price at $74.64 as of this weekend, which is a 25% drop from WrestleMania. Could WWE shareholders finally be questioning what WWE is doing as far as what they're presenting on TV and questioning the decisions, the creative decisions of Vince McMahon? Nobody knows. All we know is that the company is doing something that is desperately needed, and that is change. The show has been damaged to a point where I don't think anyone is going to come in and fix it to where it should be. Corporate sponsors and networks have killed the WWE version of pro wrestling to a point. And on top of what WWE is doing creatively, it's not ju- it's not good television. It is not good television. They are doing everything that they can to drive people to actively seek real sports presentation for their pro wrestling in the likes of New Japan Pro Wrestling, AEW, and right under their nose with NXT and NXT UK, which is widely praised by the majority of the community. People don't want this mainstream corporate entertainment anymore. Change, I know, is not going to be seen overnight. I know that. I know it 100%. Everybody should know that. Nobody should have went into Raw this week with the expectation of it being any different than it has been all year, but there is a reason. WWE announced the breaking news of Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff this week, leading to this week's shows. They knew if they generated buzz, you would be likely to tune in to see how different the shows are. WWE apparently had advertisements go out by mistake, sure they did, which I don't believe for a goddamn second, that featured Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff on flyers for their individual shows, stating that they are appearing in their new roles and come see them live on Raw and SmackDown. Done by design, people. Whether WWE wants to say it was real or a mistake, it was done on purpose. WWE has hit rock bottom bottom of the barrel, they know it, and they were so desperate for attention this week that you all fell for it like a fucking sucker. Stomping ground scene, three for one ticket sales. 
Last I checked, Extreme Rules is doing the same thing as Stomping Grounds is doing. Two for one up until Sunday. So if you're in the greater Philadelphia area and you want to go see Extreme Rules, take advantage of the two for one deal, which should never be the case for WWE. But this is the landscape that they are currently sitting in right now. Stomping Grounds drew 6,000 people. For pay-per-view, that is terrible. Raw the following night, 3,500 people. For a Monday night flagship show, that is pathetic. SmackDown Live drew 2,500 people the next night. For a supposed number one pro wrestling company in the world, that is downright laughable and actually quite sad. I don't feel sorry for them whatsoever. It is their own fault that they're in this boat. People are so gullible and forgiving in the wrestling community, and I just don't understand this simpleton logic. It's baffling how people, how stupid the majority of the common wrestling fan is. They watch, and they don't analyze. They don't think for themselves. They follow a trend or the opinion of others and stick to that. Content creators like myself on this platform say something no matter what. If it's good or bad, they could say anything. And you all follow right behind the majority opinion because you all know that if you stray from that, the backlash you will receive is going to be fierce. I found that out this week single-handedly. A really bad backlash from mindless idiots who hate simply because you don't fit into the narrative that they want to hear. The community is like a train. The train needs all its wheels to be working properly. If one wheel is damaged and falls off, the train won't operate correctly. That's the mentality that I encountered myself this week. I was the broken wheel. I took a stance on Raw because I know what I watched, while others were blind to the fact that WWE played you like a fucking Prince guitar solo. I laughed. I laughed because people don't think. Paul Heyman had very little to do with Monday Night Raw. Eric Bischoff had absolutely nothing to do with SmackDown Live. In fact, he wasn't even at SmackDown Live as somebody came to me personally and said that he physically seen Eric Bischoff in Stamford, Connecticut at a mall in town with his wife shopping. He wasn't at SmackDown Live. He was probably in Stamford Titan Tower going over what he needs to know, but he physically wasn't there at SmackDown Live, and I know he will be taking over his role after Extreme Rules. They both will not be taking over their roles completely, like I said, until Extreme Rules, but that didn't stop the community from being the most idiotic I have seen all year. With the announcement of Paul Heyman on Raw, WWE wanted you to believe that he was in charge of the show. Nothing was stated about when he would start. You automatically assumed he would start because he's there every single week, readily available anyway because of his involvement with Brock Lesnar. People had it in their minds that you were all going to see change immediately. And when we didn't, I spoke up about it like I usually do. And I am an advocate for change more so than anybody. We didn't get that change. I spoke out. People backlashed against me. I want change, like I said, more than anybody, but I spoke out about it because I want to let people know what is really going on. There's one thing about what I do here. I am always truthful and honest and upfront with every single one of you watching me. That's been the case for over five years. I don't bullshit you. I don't do something for my own narrative. I am not angry for the sake of being angry. I don't shit on Monday Night Raw because it's the cool thing to do. I don't shit on Monday Night Raw because it gets me views. That's laughable. I could sit here and talk positively about a show. It's going to get me views anyway because I've developed a, a trusted opinion in this community where people want to legitimately know what I thought to see if it correlates with what they're thinking. They know that I don't bullshit. That's why people come back here and listen to what I have to say. And I don't mean that to stroke my own cock. That's the way it is. You all had it ingrained on your minds that Paul Heyman was running the show. And he really wasn't. He was sitting in Gorilla with Vince McMahon. They went over each segment of the show. Paul Heyman was probably learning how Vince McMahon does his job on a week-to-week -week basis. But that doesn't mean Paul Heyman was in charge of the overall three hours of Monday Night Raw. 
So when people stated it was the same shit you see every single week, everybody that loved the show attacked those who didn't like the show. You wanted it to be something so badly that you created your own narrative and tried to desperately spew your narrative to people on which segments Paul Heyman was actually a part of. You spewed your bullshit to anyone that would listen on how the show had a different feel and a different vibe, laughable opinions. Some people were saying that it felt like old school ECW. I sat there watching and hearing the reaction of an entire community with my hands out, asking myself, what the fuck is wrong with you people? What was so different about Monday Night Raw? What was so different about the show? Let me break this down and find out what you guys really see that I did not see. Braun Strowman versus Bobby Lashley, false count anywhere. How is this different than any other week with Braun Strowman and Bobby Lashley? You do realize that Bobby Lashley has been feuding with Braun Strowman since the beginning of the year, probably dating back to before 2019, whether it was Drew McIntyre, Baron Corbin, or Bobby Lashley going at it himself with Braun Strowman. I could end your argument right there, but I won't, because I enjoy making you all look foolish. WWE has them explode the LED boards on the Raw stage. We see uh, an early fireworks show week. On the Raw stage, we see an, an overabundance of fireworks, and Corey Graves yells out, holy shit, on commentary. Corey Graves, by the way, saying holy shit was not a Paul Heyman directive. It actually came from Vince McMahon. It was a Vince McMahon call, a call that was done for one specific reason for WWE to appeal to their audience as cool. They needed a big angle and a big spot to sell the entirety of a show that was literally the same shit that you've seen all year. They replayed the scene five different times on every single hour, at the top of every hour, and in between every segment because they had nothing else on the show worth shit in the form of change. They even started SmackDown Live talking about the big angle that was Braun Strowman and Bobby Lashley. In fact, what was so different here with Braun Strowman that we haven't seen in Braun Strowman for the last two and a half years? I'm going to go out on a limb and say his attack on Roman Reigns in the back where he strapped Roman Reigns to a gurney and threw him off the loading dock. And then as Reigns was loaded into an ambulance, Braun Strowman tipped over that ambulance This on this night was better than that. I don't think so, people. You're watching the same shit, and WWE is covering up this entire scenario with a dash of cool. Too late. Good effort, but too late. The New Day versus the War Raiders. As you all know, I shall not call them by their Monday night slave names. Hanson and Roe is what they are. I had a lot of hope for it. Two legit great tag teams... Match ends with Samoa Joe choking out Xavier Woods on the outside, causing a DQ. I loved it. I thought it was great. It showcased Joe as a lethal Samoan, wanting to take down Kofi's friends before their Extreme Rules match. We still don't have a reason as to why Samoa Joe, a Raw superstar, is challenging Kofi Kingston, a SmackDown Live superstar, for the WWE title, immediately after Joe lost the US title, which is a Raw title, to Ricochet, a Raw superstar at Stomping Grounds. Look at me asking logical questions. I guess that doesn't apply here, or in WWE for that matter. That will be 10 lashes on the wrist, Mr. JD, for wanting logic. Anyway, what does WWE do? What should have been a showcase tag team match between two legit badass tag teams turns into a six-man tag the rudimentary, ordinary, generic six-man tag on Monday Night Raw with the New Day versus the War Raiders and Samoa Joe all for the sake of going to a fucking commercial just so that wrestling isn't shown during the commercial. Why are Kofi and Joe in the ring together two weeks before the pay-per-view? Why are the War Raiders, who debuted as baby faces on the main roster, you fucking cretins, They debuted as baby faces on the main roster. Now heel and teaming with Samoa Joe. Heel. Was it ever explained? I heard people legitimately argue with me on social media that the War Raiders came up as heels. You all went fucking stupid overnight. 
They were NXT Tag Team Champions on their debut night. NXT Tag Team Champions that were fucking baby faces. Number one. Oh, but it's not the main run. I don't give a shit. Baby faces. They were baby faces when they won the titles. They were baby faces when they relinquished the titles to William Regal. They were baby faces on their main roster debut as NXT Tag Team Champions. With the crowd chanting, WAR! As they went to commercial break. Heels? No. You're stupid and watching what you only want to watch. Go back and watch their debut. Baby faces. Wasn't explained to me. I don't know where you got this explanation from. If you did, I'd love to know. The Street Profits make their debut. Change? Not so much. Unexplained garbage? Yes. They are NXT Tag Team Champions. War Raiders came up as NXT Tag Team Champions, but they weren't allowed to show up on Monday Night Raw with the NXT Tag Team titles. But the War, War Raiders got thrown into a lot of nothing. NXT Tag Team Champions that should have been showcased to showcase how important the tag team division is in NXT. The Street Profits were allowed to show up on Monday Night Raw with said tag team championships. How does this come off on TV? Exactly how I perceive it. You're the NXT Tag Team Champions and are there with no explanation. Until I get an explanation as to why these guys are out there, it should not even be a segment on the show, but it's legit change, right? They did it because... And I'm going to throw this out on a limb, folks. I'm going to go out there. I might be reaching to some, but I think I do have a point in my statement. The Street Profits, not only were they brought to Monday Night Raw to give WWE that cool factor. There are reports that WWE wants to get cool in the eyes of the young audience so that the young audience doesn't defect over to AEW, which right now is currently happening. But the Street Profits made their debut on Monday Night Raw because, and this might be a small reason, but it definitely is a factor, because Private Party had such a huge night at Fighter Fest that Private Party and the Street Profits almost are identical in what they do. They're the same type of tag team. Young, youthful, exuberant, charismatic, athletic party appeal to a young audience. WWE has that same type of tag team in the Street Profits. And after everybody was talking about Private Party at Fighter Fest, don't you think it's quite the coincidence that a team similar to Private Party under the WWE banner is making their debut on Monday Night Raw immediately following the Saturday of Fighter Fest? I don't know, folks. Could be, couldn't be. You make that determination for yourself. But it's changed though, right? WWE pulling talent from NXT without any plans or direction sounds like the same old shit to me. Miz versus Elias in a two out of three falls match. Well, what exactly was on the line here? New guitar strings, new pair of drumsticks, maybe a double bass pedal for Elias, maybe a new piano. Same match, the same exact match, down to the way the pinfalls were determined from SmackDown Live just a week ago. I remember when two out of three falls matches actually meant something. I remember when two out of three falls matches would end in a 60-minute fucking draw with only being one fall determined. Or better yet, like I said, that one fall going the distance up until the very end, whether it's 60 minutes, 30 minutes, or later on in the match. Now we're getting one fall to happen in 30 seconds. The second fall happens in 90 seconds, all for the sake of going to a fucking commercial during the match. There's no time limits. There's no intrigue. There's no build. What is on the line? It's the same shit you just watched on Tuesday, but it was a step in the right direction, right? Idiots. The Undertaker being advertised. It's like watching a rerun of Seinfeld, but when I watch Seinfeld, at least I am entertained. Seth Rollins and Becky Lynch, a storyline that is legitimately killing both Becky Lynch and Seth Rollins and whatever momentum they have, which right now is virtually zero. You take both of their biggest championships on the show. A pair that is currently dating. I'm not sure if you guys realize this. Becky Lynch is Seth Rollins' girlfriend. I'm not sure if you realize that, folks. You pair both of them together because the champions are dating and you use that as a driving force on the show because you are incapable of delivering your champions and championships in a meaningful way. So you rather just build them up through TMZ tabloid garbage. Still to this day, the most interesting thing about Becky Lynch is Ronda Rousey. Seth Rollins is your universal champion, a championship that is number one in WWE. And the most interesting thing about your universal champion 
is the foolish comments he made in a Sports Illustrated interview and his online Twitter beef with someone who's not even in the WWE in Will Osprey. Some change there, guys. Some change. Keep reaching. Mike and Maria Canellis, if you found this interesting, you're out of your mind. First of all, who is Mike and Maria Canellis to you? Did you even know they were still with the company? Do you know that they were even competing on 205 Live? Yeah, it may be a fresh face, and a face that has no business being in the ring with the Universal Champion, a face that really shouldn't even be on Monday Night Raw, all because it's fresh and new to the dwindling audience doesn't make it a good segment. The entire pregnancy angle, wherever they go with it, if Mike Kanellis is even going to be named as the father in this fucking thing, did nothing more than embarrass a man for a political agenda and make him look like a fool after they both reportedly ranted on social media about quitting, then turn right back around and sign five-year deals with the company to stay. The entire segment was cringe, uh, as cringe as you could possibly ever get for this show, but being that it's raw, I'm not surprised. It fit right into the overall terrible nature of the show regardless. An absolute waste of everybody's time that did favors to nobody. Lacey Evans versus Natalia. Excuse me while I yawn. Alexa Bliss losing to Carmella in five seconds. Why? Then she gets a title shot in two weeks against Bailey. Awesome. Carmella losing to Nikki Cross in the same night with 50-50 booking happening right before your eyes in the quickest fashion I have ever seen. Some change there, guys. Some change. Ricochet versus AJ Styles in the main event for the U.S. title. We seen the match last week. Didn't make sense then. Didn't make sense now. AJ Styles beats the champion because the company refuses to build up legit characters through wins. They refuse to make their championships look strong. He beats the champion in a non-title match, then gets a championship match. Ricochet lost on his first night as United States champion. Let's do it again. This time with a fuck finish, restart, and Ricochet gets his win back in about 10 minutes. 50-50 booking. Then we get the predictable AJ Styles and club reunion. As all three men turned heel on the babyface Ricochet. Three years too late, folks. I'm not sure if you all remember. Yes, AJ Styles and the club came in at the same time. They were paired together for a short time. They were heels together while they were beating up John Cena. And then what happened later that summer? They were fucking split up for three years. Absolutely no inclination of them getting back together, you simpleton fucks. They paired them together out of necessity because they came in together. They should have always been together. Three years is a long fucking time to waste away on an angle that should have been creative and fun with all three men. Like I said, three years too late, folks. They are together now. What's the point? The only one who needed it was AJ Styles. Heel AJ was needed, and heel AJ is great. The club? If they haven't signed new WWE deals yet, what's the best way for WWE to manipulate those who might be thinking of leaving to go to AEW to pair them up with their best friend and pretend they have plans for you in a reunion of a worldwide loved faction in the club? Which, by the way, was also not a Paul Heyman directive at the end of the show. Any more? I'm waiting. I'm waiting, folks. I'm waiting. Again, I ask you, where's the change? How is this show different from what we usually get? Are you all that blinded because you got a club reunion after three years? While they missed out on a major feud with The Shield? When The Shield was still a thing? Clearly, that can't happen now. And why are you so excited about it happening on Raw? How is it fresh and exciting? It's something that should have been done, so spare me the excitement. I look at it more like a missed opportunity, unless we get... Adam Cole leading the Undisputed Era and the club adding Fergal Devitt to it and making it a four-on-four for the Survivor Series, spare me the bullshit. The sad thing about all of this is people still refuse to listen. Raw drew their biggest rating in several weeks, averaging 2,496,000 viewers this week. People are throwing a fucking parade. I kid you not. People are legitimately excited about this. The YouTube community are actually throwing a fucking parade over the rating that Raw got this week. On June 3rd, okay, July 5th, on June 3rd, Raw 
drew 2,405,000 viewers. June 3rd. What happened on June 3rd, folks? Nothing. Garbage as always every single week. This week was not much higher than June 3rd. Why did they trend higher this week compared to the last three weeks? WWE advertised Heyman and Bischoff indirectly in their new roles, and the 90,000 more people that tuned in this week was out of sheer curiosity. That 90,000 is very minuscule, folks, so I don't know where the fuck you're throwing a parade over Monday Night Raw trending upwards. I guess the rating on June 3rd really didn't mean anything to you guys then. Where was the parade then? I understand you all want WWE to do well, as do I. Slow your fucking rolls and calm the fuck down. Just because you were suckered in by WWE doesn't mean the shows were different. I am here to tell you that they weren't. Commentary spewing curse words and Braun Strowman doing Braun Strowman things for the last two years that he's been doing is not what I call different. Sit the fuck down. I'll hand you all your sippy cups, sit by the kitty table, and you speak when spoken to. Speaks volumes how a ratings increase will pop such excitement from blind and mindless people like this in the community. Is it because everyone is so excited about AEW? Are you really this stupid? Do the majority stock... Do you people own majority stock in the company? Do you sit next to Vince McMahon in Stamford, Connecticut as he writes these shows? What is it? Why are you celebrating a step in the right direction? Why are you following others who said it was a great show when in actuality, as I described here, it really wasn't? And it continued the illogical booking of a company that can't cut it anymore. Give it time. Rome wasn't built in a day. Change takes time. Give it a chance. You are all so easily amused. The best one is, I finally wasn't bored during Monday Night Raw. Is this what your expectations have sunk to? Is this, is, this is what your expectations have become. I wasn't bored during Monday Night Raw. The bar has been set so low for this show that it literally... It literally could put on anything and you people would have been excited. If that's how you want your wrestling show to be, bro, I can't roll with you. Raw generated a ratings increase and the shows were still terrible as they've always been. Seriously, Raw could have generated a rating on an increase and the shows could have still been terrible. I wouldn't be celebrating anything if I was you. If Raw put on a string of good shows and by string I mean five, six, seven great shows in a row... Then that's cause for optimism. Not one fucking show in the middle of the summer because Paul Heyman's name was attached to the show. He basically had nothing to do with outside of his segment and a certain talent appearing like the Street Profits. Raw suckered you in with a generic spot that they have repeated over the course of the week 3,000 times already. How many of you realized there was the same fucking show this week covered in ideas possibly by Paul Heyman for the long run. If WWE can't main the small amount of viewers that they did next week for this increase this week, then it's a complete failure. Nobody should be happy about one good week in the ratings department when the shows actually improve, which I hope that they do. Believe me, I will tell you. I want my Raw back to what I know it could be. When the shows actually improve and stay steady, similar to what NXT does every week, then I'll be the ones partying along with you. In fact... The beverages are on me. I gotta try and win back some of those people who know I'm right, but merely right now are angry with me over the fact that I am right in this very moment. Calm down, guys. Calm down. It was the same fucking shit, like I said on Monday. It was the same shit that was just covered in new executive director, Paul Heyman. All you marks, you call me a fucking mark, a Johnny... Gargano Mark and Adam Cole Mark, right? You, you guys were marking out over the fact that Paul Heyman had everything to do with Monday Night Raw, and in fact, he had nothing to do with Monday Night Raw except sitting next to Vince McMahon in Gorilla watching the show progress over three hours, which ultimately resulted in Monday Night Raw being the same shit. Calm down. A ratings increase this week over June 3rd of 90,000 fucking people is not a change. The show changed nothing. And clearly, going into Monday Night Raw this week, the show is not changing this week either, so I await your fucking venom, as always. Monday Night Raw is delivering Seth Rollins and Becky Lynch versus Andrade and Zelina Vega. So let's play this mixed tag team gimmick all the way to the pay-per-view, 
and run it dry before we get to the actual pay-per-view. Shane McMahon and Drew McIntyre are teaming up against Roman Reigns and a partner of his choosing. What sense does that make when the ultimate partner is teaming up with him on Sunday? So we gotta see the same garbage in the same bullshit story two, two times in a row before we get to Sunday. I don't give a fuck who Roman Reigns chooses as his opponent. It's not gonna be better than what we see on Sunday, so why give it to us when we don't wanna see it on Sunday? Yet this is the company that you stand firmly behind and wanna give an easy pass to. Grow up, guys. Grow up. I am here to analyze. I am here to give my opinion. I am here to give you guys exactly what you're watching. Again, I have no control over what you're thinking. I can only give you so much information. It's up to you to use it wisely. Everything I said here is absolutely 100% fact. And I don't want to hear anything from anybody else. Raw will continue to be garbage until Vince McMahon steps away. And from what I read today, with his involvement in the XFL... Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff might not even have a chance to sit down with Vince McMahon so he could go over the scripts, which will probably lead to Vince McMahon still giving full, or giving himself full creative control over the shows while using Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff as fucking pawns. Because now that we know they're associated with the shows, our venom is now going to be directed at them. Meanwhile, Vince McMahon gets an easy out. Calm down. You guys will see change when I see change, and I will let you know. That's all I have to say about that. This is Off the Script, episode 281, part one. I got much more coming. We'll hit the intro. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. What is going on, guys? Thank you so very much for joining me right here on the podcast. It is Off the Script, Friday, July 5th, 2019. I hope you guys had a great 4th of July holiday. I didn't do much myself. Just very relaxing. A couple beers, Braves beating up on the Phillies. So, there you go. That's all I did. But we got a lot to go over today, man. It's been a rough week. I want to try and get my bearings back after all the, the hate. Coming at me this week for my stance on Monday Night Raw, which was the same stance I've been, I would say, the same stance I've been on for the majority of 2019, and it's just unbelievable to me how Paul Heyman's name is now officially attached as Executive Director of Monday Night Raw, Head of Creative, and everybody comes at me as if I'm the fucking problem. I'm just telling you exactly what you watched. So... I hope that you guys got a lot of information out of that open. I hope that you guys really understand where I'm coming from and what I watched on Monday. I want change. I want change more than anyone in this community. I don't like being negative. You guys can watch me on Wednesdays. I'm hardly negative on Wednesdays, man. I'm very much positive when I talk about NXT or when there is a takeover show. Monday Night Raw has not given given me any reason to be positive whatsoever. And I don't give a shit if Paul Heyman is attached to the show or not. Even with him there. If it sucks, I'm going to let you know. Get used to it. Please. I don't expect change to happen until after SummerSlam, to be quite honest with you. And a lot of people are in the same boat as me. You can see little inklings of change, but that does not make the shows good. I'm letting you know. So make sure you guys just take a step back and realize what you're watching. I'm here to give you all the information that I gather on my end of things, so hopefully you guys can understand my point of view. We got a lot to go over today, man. We're going to go over why the Street Profits were brought to Monday Night Raw, and I gave a little glimpse into that on the open of this show. WWE reportedly very upset with Maria Kanellis. When Maria Kanellis told WWE that she was pregnant, rumor killer on WWE's creative changes with Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff, why it was made, there are rumors going around. And I want to squash those rumors today. And a reason why Triple H was not 
chosen as executive director of Monday Night Raw. We're going to go over all that plus so much more right here on the podcast. Make sure you guys check out all the other videos that you might have missed in the coming week, man. You got Fighter Fest off the script last week and go and check all that stuff out. Raw, SmackDown, and NXT. NXT was fantastic this week with Adam Cole's championship celebration tour where he actually took a trip to Johnny Gargano's family-owned pizzeria. And he walked in, and the look on his mother and father's face were absolutely brilliant. He walked in, he ordered four pizzas, he hung a picture of himself on Johnny's father, Frank, and his wall of fame. Then he went to a local wrestling school in Cleveland that Johnny Gargano was actually a part of. He visited, he gave some words of inspiration to all the students there. And Adam Cole came in there and said, listen, give up, have a pizza, take a pizza home, sit on the couch. You will never amount to anything. This was classic television, folks. Classic television from one Adam Cole, baby. Go check all that stuff out. Link is in the top right corner that you see right there. The I, drop it down. Everything you need will be right there. Follow me on social media, at JD from NY206. That's both on Twitter and Instagram. Hit that subscribe button. Turn on that bell for all notifications. You guys usually, if you join the channel as well, you see the, you'll see the little join button next to the bell. If you guys want to join, you guys can certainly do that. You'll get off the script early on most weeks. This week I took a little break for myself, being that it was the 4th of July holiday, and it kind of fell on the day where I usually record. I usually record on Thursday, but it was a holiday, and I didn't want to stay inside all day. So I went to go have some craft beers. I watched the Brave game, and it was uh, just a relaxing time. But you guys normally will get off the script early. Same deal with the Patreon. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. You guys usually get the early access to off the script. And you get audio formats of Raw, SmackDown, and NXT and all the podcasts during the week right there on Patreon. So if you guys want to support via Patreon, completely optional. It's the only way to get exclusive content content not available on YouTube. That is Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Got to shout out my fine friends over at Harry's, man. Harry's.com slash script. Did you guys know the average guy spent 3,000 hours of his life shaving? Seems like this week, people spent more than 3,000 hours complaining about why I hated Monday Night Raw. Don't waste four months of your life overpaying for poor performing razors. Harry's, a razor that is so sharp, You can shave less often, and you will save more money. Just $2 per blade. Join the 10 million who have tried Harry's and claim your offer today by using our unique link, harrys.com slash script. Harry's founders were two regular guys, like you and I, who were tired of getting ripped off and paying for overpriced gimmicks. Vibrating heads, flex balls, handles that look like a prop in a cheesy sci-fi movie, These are just some of the tactics that the leading brands have used to overcharge us for years. I want you guys to know that Harry's makes quality, durable blades at a fair price. Like I mentioned earlier, just $2 per blade. To keep prices low, they cut out the middleman. They bought a world-class blade factory in Germany that's been making some of the best razor blades in the world for 99 years. This isn't some Seth Rollins garbage where this is the best pro wrestling in the world, and we all know that it's not. But I could tell you that Harry's is the best razor in the world, and it's absolutely 100% fact. Now they can provide great quality at factory direct prices and a 100% quality guarantee. If you don't love your shave, let them know, and they will give you a full refund. JD, this sounds great. What am I going to get? Well, you're going to get a razor handle with an easy grip. Choice of color is up to you. Orange, navy blue, or the evergreen. I got all three. Why not? Five-blade razor with a lubricating strip and a trimmer blade for a close, comfortable shave. Rich lathering shave gel that will leave you smelling great. And a travel blade cover to keep your razor dry and easy on the go. Listeners of my show can redeem their trial set at harrys.com slash script. Once again, folks, that's harrys.com slash script. To redeem your offer, let them know that JD sent you to help support Off The Script. A lot of people were asking the same question on Monday night. What are the NXT Tag Team Champions, the Street Profits, doing on Monday Night Raw? This is not some expected call-up 
This is not something that I think is needed or wanted right now. It's not a case of the tag team division needs the Street Profits NXT and their tag team division needs the Street Profits more than the main roster does. But I hate the simple fact. And again, every single point I tried to make during the week, people wanted to argue with me and create their own narrative. I fucking hate when a talent gets called up from NXT and it's... Like that. No build, no plans, no video package, no hype package, nothing. Absolutely nothing. I remember back in the day, and I always go back to using this because it made you want to see him so much after what they did to hype him up. You guys remember during the Attitude Era when Val Venus was shown on the Titan? I wish they could do shit like this now. Where Val Venus was shown through four, five, six weeks of vignettes him popping out of the fucking bush with a helmet on, pretending to be in the military, and he's got some woman, some porn star, it could be anybody, just down below in the bush giving him a blowjob. Remember that? Or he's on the scene, or he's on the set of the next scene that he's filming for whatever movie he's going to be taking part in, you know, rock hard or something like that. Whatever, it was creative. It was creative. You know, he was in the shower, he was in a fucking Lamborghini going through a, ho- a car wash and some fucking broad was giving him a blowjob right there in the fucking passenger seat. Four or five weeks of vignettes and Val Venus was the hottest fucking thing on WWE TV and he didn't even have a fucking match. He didn't have a match. Now, granted, this is the Attitude Era where they did things a little bit more risque and they did things with excitement. But WWE doesn't factor how important that is to... The current crop of NXT talent. Do you guys want the Undisputed Era to be called up and just randomly show up on Raw or SmackDown? Or do you want high packages to see what they did? Because honestly, with the with the difference of people who are watching NXT and, and the main roster product, it's vast. It's not as vast as people think it is, but it's vast. There's a big difference there. Not many people are going to know who the Street Profits are. Not many people are going to know who Adam Cole is or how important Adam Cole has been to NXT. You need to highlight this shit. Same thing with the War Raiders. They got brought up randomly. Nobody expected, nobody knew as tag team champions that they would be called up. They had two match of the year quality matches with the Undisputed Era and Ricochet and Black. And here we are. Here we are. They're making their debut and nobody knows who they are. They should have shown highlights of every match that they had as tag team champions to build excitement around who they are, what they are, what they mean, what their gimmick is, how important their Viking culture is to them. Nothing. We haven't gotten a fucking thing about any of that. And people tend to think that I like the unpredictability of just pulling an NXT talent and putting them on Raw and SmackDown. There you go. No, I don't. I never said anything like that at all whatsoever. I didn't agree with it with the War Raiders. I didn't agree with it. For the Street Profits. Now, why did the Street Profits make their debut on Monday Night Raw? Well, the Wrestling Observer Newsletter noted that Angelo Dawkins and Montez Ford and their Raw debut was a Paul Heyman decision. This was a Paul Heyman. This is one of the very few things that Paul Heyman did have a hand in for Monday Night Raw. He wants them on Raw to help appeal to a younger audience, but they will not be exclusive to any brand right now. As current NXT Tag Team Champions, they will appear on both NXT and Raw at this point because NXT doesn't want to lose another set of champions to the main roster, but Heyman also wanted them on Monday Night Raw. So a happy medium was reached that will keep the Street Profits quite busy in the process. From a technical standpoint, this was Heyman asking for them to be on television, but they are still considered not Raw, but as NXT talent and will continue to work NXT shows while doing TV on Monday. Ford and Dawkins will most likely transition onto the main roster full-time, but as of right now, they will not be leaving NXT. This could get confusing because NXT tapes so many weeks in advance, so it's unavoidable, but hopefully the Street Profits will connect to a younger audience and the fan base as Heyman envisions. Now, the good thing about this is that NXT has already taped the weeks all the way up till SummerSlam weekend. So they're set. They're set. 
whoever the street profits are going up against, I am kind of in the mindset of whoever they're going up against, they're more than likely going to lose the NXT Tag Team titles. Then after that, they will be brought up to the main roster. I, I don't really think that's the, the brightest of ideas, but we'll see what happens. I honestly think with Adam Cole, if you guys have been watching NXT, I honestly think whatever Adam Cole has kind of put that put out in the universe with them having all the gold is, is exactly where WWE is going with this. Adam Cole is going to be the NXT champion by the end of the year. It's no secret that he's going in part three with Johnny at TakeOver in Toronto. You, you could see where it's going on TV. They're not going to have an Adam Cole-Johnny Gargano match on regular television. It's going to be safe for the pay-per-view. How they go about it, how they top what they did in the first two encounters, I, I don't know. That remains to be seen. But Adam Cole is going to be the NXT champion. I could see, I could envision the Street Profits and the Undisputed Era having a fucking classic at TakeOver Toronto. I could see Bobby Fish and Kyle O'Reilly once again, the tag team champions in NXT. Roderick Strong and the Velveteen Dream, it looks like that's where they're going with that, just by the little seeds that have been planted on NXT TV. I could see Roddy as the North American champion. And you know what? He fucking deserves it. When you look back at NXT television for 2019, it's so easy to go, oh, Johnny's the MVP. Oh, Adam Cole is the MVP. If you're looking at an MVP in 2019, you have to consider Roderick Strong. The guy has had absolute classics this year. No matter who he's in the ring with. And I think he is so vital to NXT and vital to the Undisputed Era. I could see them having all the gold going into war games. I mentioned this on NXT. I could see the Undisputed Era versus Imperium at war games. There really is no other stable in NXT to rival the Undisputed Era. I could see Adam Cole, Bobby Fish, Kyle O'Reilly, and Roderick Strong going up against Alexander Wolfe, Walter, and the European Union of Eichner and Bartel. Now, I don't know if NXT UK is going to have a, a mid-card title given to them throughout the year. I don't know. Alexander Wolfe might be the only one who don't have a championship. But I could see Bartel and Eichner win the tag team championships. Walter is not losing that title. I could see that being the case. So we'll see what happens. I think that would be absolutely fucking amazing if that happened. But the Street Profits on Raw... I don't mind it. I don't mind it. It, it. It's something that Heyman sees. Heyman knows the product. Heyman knows the the outside world in pro wrestling. He's, he's in sync with what's going on. He knows what's going to appeal and what's going to work. He knows the landscape of the business. He knows what's going on with AEW. He's in the know. He's in the know, whereas Vince McMahon is not in the know. I don't mind this so much as long as they do not wrestle on Monday Night Raw. I don't know what they're going to do. They might be the resident party animals of Monday Night Raw. I hope it doesn't come off in a cringe-like way where, where people don't like them just based on their attitude. They are a great tag team. Montez Ford is fucking money. If you have not watched Montez Ford in any way, reserve your judgment until you see Montez Ford in the ring. Believe me. I don't mind this if they don't wrestle. I hope that with Paul Heyman in charge, whenever the full initiative takes place, I hope Tag Team Wrestling takes a president. I hope that they get placed on a brand and whatever brand they're on has a solid tag team division because that's what we deserve. That's what the WWE needs. Solid tag team division. With Heyman and Bischoff in charge, there needs to be a really exclusive feel to the brand split. Raw is Raw, SmackDown is SmackDown. Wherever they land, they are going to be a vital part of that tag team division. you got so many tag teams on the main roster right now, that are just floating around. You need to have some sort of order. I don't want them to wrestle. If they're there as the resident party animals, great. As long as they continue their shit in NXT, I'm fine. Another thing is, and I mentioned this in the beginning, and it's not that far out there as a, a, a reason. It's not really me reaching or stretching for anything to find an excuse to shit on WWE. This is the case, folks. AEW is appealing to a younger audience. Private Party is amongst those wrestlers on that roster that are going to appeal to a younger audience. You know, I know. I've watched them grow and develop in House of Glory. I've seen them just kill it at Fighter Fest. They're going to be all over Fight for the Fallen. They're going to be featured. In fact, their performance from Fighter Fest has landed them a new contract. 
a full-time deal with AEW. You will, you will be seeing them in their tag team division in, in October on TNT. Street Profits are very similar to the private party. You know, they're, they're charismatic, they're athletic, they're party animals. Montez Ford has the red solo cup. Private party loves to take shots and party, mingle with the young pretty women. You know, it's the same the same concept. They're not the same tag team. They're very similar styles, you know. It's the same concept. They appeal. So how much of Paul Heyman's decision is based on what is kind of going on right now with the climate of what AEW is doing? Is, is the Street Profits being placed on Monday Night Raw because of the huge popularity that Private Party is now accumulating for AEW? It's a definite plausible reason to go and think that you guys might think differently I don't I don't think that saying that or thinking that is that out there it's not me reaching it's just me comparing two similar tag teams and two similar circumstances I don't mind it as long as the street profits stay off of Monday Night Raw as far as an in-ring aspect goes they need to continue doing what they're doing in NXT their tag team championship reign is barely new They've had one defense against the Forgotten Sons, which wasn't even really a defense because the Forgotten Sons got themselves disqualified. Now they're going up against Lorcan and Birch on NXT. Then, ultimately, we'll see the Undisputed Era get involved. That's what I assume, and by the seeds that have been planted on NXT television, that's exactly where they're going. But we'll see what happens, man. Street Profits definitely add some charisma to Monday Night Raw where they might be lacking in that department. We'll see what happens. Them being in backstage segments isn't really what I call change. When I see them legitimately having a factor in the tag team division and a resurgence in tag team wrestling on both Raw and SmackDown, then I will say, yeah, we're on the road to hopeful change. Right now, it's not change. WWE reportedly very upset with Maria Kanellis. Brad Shepard reported on the All You Didn't Know podcast, and I know... J.D., why are you reporting about Brad Shepard? Why are you listening to Brad Shepard, man? He's a clickbaiter. Listen, I don't mind Brad Shepard's work. Nobody's right all the time. I don't mind it, but I believe in this story. So Brad Shepard says that he spoke to a source in WWE, and they're not happy with Maria Kanellis announcing her pregnancy. This source called them shit and continued to say that a push shouldn't be expected any time soon. According to this source, he says, and I quote, according to this source in WWE, the company is very upset about Maria announcing her pregnancy after her and her husband re-signed new contracts. The source described them as shit and said not to expect a significant push any time soon, end quote. If you're WWE, you wouldn't be pissed? I would be. You get pregnant, right? You don't announce the pregnancy. She didn't look pregnant. She comes out, signs a five-year deal, and then she announced to WWE after she signed the dotted line, yeah, I'm pregnant, I'm going to be out another nine months. Which Mike is probably going to have to be out sometime as well to be home with her and the kid. So there you go. If I'm giving you money to stay, which I don't know why they did because they're fucking worthless, if I'm giving you X amount of money to stay, then you're going to pull that on me? You already were pregnant on my watch. You went through drug rehab on my watch. We were very supportive of you. Now you're pregnant again after we just signed you to exclusive five-year deals worth more money than the last contract? That's fucked up. That's fucked up. So you could tell by their actions, if this is the case, that Mike and Maria Kanellis don't give a fuck about their standing in the WWE. They don't give a fuck about their reputation. They don't give a shit about the pro wrestling business. They're in it to make as much money as they can to do whatever they need to do to support their children. Which is fine, but be a little bit more humble about it. Be a little bit more respectful about it. They clearly have none of that, and she pulled this on them after she signed the dotted line with her and her husband. So there you go. So, gone for nine months. She made a return to the ring in very quick fashion. She looked great after the first child was born. And WWE could have been preparing this angle for a real-life pregnancy angle. And Paul Heyman... I don't know if he had anything to do with this. I don't think so. People were reporting that Paul Heyman had something to do with this. This is a Vince McMahon fucking thing. This is Vince McMahon DNA all over it. This is what Vince said. Why would Paul Heyman take a job as executive director and go to the most cringeworthy fucking thing he could do? Yeah, let's do a pregnancy angle with the possibility of Maria being pregnant on live television. And who's the baby father? Who's the baby's father? 
You think Paul Heyman wants to do that when the first thing that Paul Heyman should do is getting this show back to a respectful fucking stance with the fans. I don't think so, folks. This is Vince McMahon all day long. So there you go. I don't think this is Paul Heyman by any stretch of the imagination. Now, when me... I can't even fucking speak here. When Maria Kanellis told WWE that she was pregnant. When did she actually say that she was pregnant? So, Mike Kanellis was absolutely buried by his real-life wife, Maria, on Raw. Garbage. It was such a cringe-like segment with Seth Rollins and Becky Lynch just standing there looking like fucking two dolts. So, Maria Kanellis said she was pregnant. Apparently, she really is pregnant. She stood there on the apron during the tag team match on Raw this week. I don't even know. If she's pregnant, she shouldn't be anywhere by the ringside area. Shouldn't be doing anything. Brian Alvarez noted on the Wrestling Observer Radio that this was probably the most WWE has ever paid talents when they are guaranteed not to make their money back on them. Because Maria emasculated Mike in such a huge way. Not only did she call him her bitch before they went out, but after she revealed her pregnancy, she doubted that Mike was even man enough to do it and, and get her pregnant. Now, Dave Meltzer noted that Mike and Maria Canellas are making $250,000 a year for five years. That's a lot of fucking money for people who, Brian Alvarez says, WWE is not going to make their money back on them. $250,000 a year for people who I would not have minded went anywhere else. Could have went back to Ring of Honor, could have went to New Japan. I don't think AEW was interested in them. I honestly think they took the money because there wasn't any interest in them at all. Could have went back to Impact Wrestling. But knowing that they were pregnant, Maria obviously clearly knew what she was doing here. Let's take the guaranteed money. We got the new kid on the way, so let's do that. So, they're not going anywhere. This was right after Meltzer admitted that Mike Kanellis was buried so badly that this is the kind of treatment WWE would have given him if he was quitting the company and slated to show up on the opposition's television product next week. Dave Meltzer noted on the Wrestling Observer Radio that Maria Kanellis is in fact pregnant. It is unknown at this time what the payoff will be of her burying Mike Kanellis on TV. But this was also noted to be a angle that WWE is going forward with and this, people are saying it's a Paul Heyman angle. I, I don't think it's a Paul Heyman angle. I think this is Vince McMahon. And I honestly think that Paul Heyman wanted Mike Kanellis and Marie Kanellis on TV. That's the most, I would say, Paul Heyman had influence over this. But I honestly think that Vince McMahon, knowing that they were with Child, I honestly think that this is a Vince McMahon creation. Paul Heyman might have wanted them on TV, but this is all Vince McMahon directive. PW Insider reports that Mike Kanellis and Maria Kanellis informed WWE that they were with Child once again, and this was after the five-year deal. As previously reported, those deals were worth a lot, especially considering the fact that they both got into the same, or they both go into the same household. So they're both making X amount of money, which is going towards the same household. So good for them. Exactly why they took the money, because they need to look out for themselves and they don't give a shit about WWE. Story making the rounds is that Kanellis informed WWE that she was expecting again after she and Mike Kanellis signed new deals with the company, which kind of lends credibility to Brad Shepard's report of officials and management calling them bullshit for doing what they did. So there you go. Uh, I, I don't really give a shit about Mike and Maria Kanellis. It's, it, it's the basis here it is two talents that aren't worth shit that I don't give a shit about, you don't give a shit about, and it's an angle that I am not interested in. This is cringe-like worthy garbage. You might be pushing the envelope, but it's pushing the envelope in not a good way. I don't care. I don't know where this is going. Again, the further that we see this, and I don't know where they're going with this. I don't know if they're going to play up the fact that with what she said, I don't even know if you're man enough to be the father of this child. I don't think you're man enough to even get me pregnant. I don't know where they're going with this. It could open the doors to who, like I said, who the baby's father really is. And, and by that point, I am, I'm already in just complete understanding that this is a Vince McMahon angle just by what we've seen. If it goes any further along those lines, no doubt about it, it's a Vince McMahon angle. I, I don't see Paul Heyman doing this cringe-like garbage on a show that needs to right the ship and deliver realistic sports presentation. This is not it. I'm sorry. This is garbage and should not be on TV. Now... There was a rumor going around on why WWE made big creative changes with Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff. Clearly, change needed to be made. 
I mentioned that WWE, you know, could possibly have brought in Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff to kind of take the heat off of Vince McMahon, which is completely plausible in this case. Is AEW the reason for this? Possibly. I definitely think they have a reason. The AEW effect is real. Could it be that WWE is worried about how AEW is going to steal some of their fans and they want to captivate the younger audience? Could be. Could be. You can't really captivate the younger audience with a 74-year-old senile fucking Vince McMahon. So go to Paul Heyman who knows and understands what the younger audience wants. Paul Heyman who is very respected by everybody. Eric Bischoff has had his fair has has had his fair share of successes. He's also had his fair shares of failure, but I don't think it's going to take Eric Bischoff all that long to keep up to date on WWE TV. He'll be filled in almost immediately. And hopefully he could get those creative juices flowing and deliver a grittier, younger product. A more raw product than what we've seen. He said the shows were too polished, it doesn't even look real. I hope we change that. I enjoy a gritty, raw product instead of the overall polish that WWE has. But there's a rumor going around as to why WWE made these creative changes. Is it because of the stocks? Is it because of the stocks dropping? Did WWE and Vince McMahon go out there and seek help because of the stocks dropping to, like I said, $74 a share coming out of WrestleMania, decreasing value by 25%. Dave Meltzer says the WWE is making change for the stockholder's sake. It's reported since WWE was almost at $100 per share in April, and the stock plummeted to around $74 per share. Clearly, there is cause for concern. Therefore, making this creative change will bring in two names that can show investors people know who Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff really are. However, there have been sources who went in deep with this story in the financial industry, and they said that at this time, in this time frame where WWE lost 25%, that a ton of companies took a hit the same time WWE did, and it wasn't just for WWE stockholders that lost money. So Meltzer says that this change was made for the stockholders' sake. There are other sources in the community that talked to some in the financial industry that said a ton of companies at the same time took a hit just like WWE did, so it wasn't just about the stockholders and appeasing the stockholders. The fact that WWE hasn't rebounded is another story, but the fact is that stockholders are not dialed in on creative decisions. They don't give a shit. They don't give a fuck what happens as long as you see increase in their pockets. That's all they give a shit about. They they should not give a shit about what goes on TV. Uh, I wish that they did because I believe that whatever happens on TV definitely has some sort of effect on the stocks. I do think that the the current product is definitely having an effect on stocks right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Did they bring in these two to appease the stocks? Who knows? Who knows? It's it's definitely going to help if the shows get better and they generate more of an audience and we get some of that fan base that is lost right now back. It's definitely going to help the stocks. But it's not really the main reason why they took on their roles for executive directors. The fact that WWE has a rebound, it is another story. That has remained to be seen because they really haven't taken the position yet of executive director. They really haven't had 100% creative control. The reason that the company didn't rebound is because of the belief that the company was already overvalued in the first place. We've been told that this is also rumored to be why Vince McMahon, Kevin Dunn, and other <laughs> and other executive directors sold off a lot of their shares at ninety dollars a share. They knew they, that they were overpriced. Oh my God, we didn't expect to go this. Let me sell, 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 sell. Let me make some of my money back. Some of those who work on Wall Street actually expanded on this and expanded on exactly what bringing in Eric Bischoff to the company will do to the eyes of those traders on the stock market. Now. This is from a financial connection, and I quote, Bringing Eric Bischoff in isn't going to help the stocks. Most of Wall Street don't even know who Eric Bischoff is. Wall Street isn't projecting how good storylines will be. They project cash flow and top bottom lines. Attendance, ticket sales, merchandise, ratings. If the ratings are falling, then that means there's less people going to the venue and less people watching the show. 
Storylines have no effect on it. I honestly think that it all starts with the story. If you're not generating good TV quality, then everybody's going to start bouncing. Everybody's going to leave. Nobody's going to be interested in anything WWE's doing. They'll go find another alternative. So I do think that whatever they do on TV does have an effect on the stock market and the stock market prices. I really do think that. WWE stockholders and brokers who handle stock exchange only care about monetary value. We know this. They know that WWE has big television deals and Saudi Arabian money, but the short selling of, of the stock continues. Stockholders care more about television deals, attendance, merch sales, profits, and losses than storylines. So clearly, uh, I, I like I said, I don't need to reiterate myself. I don't need to repeat myself. I, I do think that everything starts with the storylines. If the storylines don't correlate to TV, then you don't get attendance. Then you don't get ratings. Then you don't get merchandise sales. People are just dropping off at record numbers. They go find another alternative. It all starts with what's on the TV. It all factors into it somehow. It all factors into the grand scheme of things. It's just not that one thing. You know, one thing leads to another. It's a fucking domino effect. So I don't want to hear about how the television product has no effect on the fucking stock market. It absolutely does. It absolutely does. Where do those people go? Where are those people going and where are they getting their wrestling fix? Clearly, WWE's not keeping their attention. They're going to find something else that interests them. It definitely does have uh, a stake on what is being done on Wall Street. Now, with Eric Bischoff and Paul Heyman... We could talk about this for hours, about why Heyman and Bischoff are there, what it means, what they're going to do, blah, blah, blah. Why wasn't Triple H chosen as executive director of Raw? My reason was that Triple H is family, and I don't think, and I mean this, I still mean it. Triple H creates, Vince kills. I don't think that Vince wants anyone right now to take a position family member, take a position that he's done for 26 years on Monday Night Raw and come in and do the job better than he does it. I think that would be a huge blow to Vince McMahon's ego. And Triple H, we all know, if he did just an inkling of what he does in NXT on the main roster, then shows would be better off for it. But there is a real reason why Triple H wasn't chosen as the executive director of Monday Night Raw. According to Dave Meltzer, on the Wrestling Observer Live. The reason for this is due to Vince McMahon not wanting Triple H to take the blame if ratings don't improve in the future, as he is far too valuable to have his name muddied by failing in his new role. So, Vince would rather Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff fail, according to Dave Meltzer, instead of his own family. Triple H is already an executive vice president of talent relations, live events, and creative for WWE, and is also founded and produces NXT, so he's probably got enough on his plate. Many assume that once Vince retires or passes away, the company will pass on to Triple H, so to not give him more influence on weekly TV will come to a surprise to many people. So that's the reason. Dave Meltzer believes that Vince thinks Triple H is far too valuable to have him fail at the TV ratings, or, or to have him fail as far as Raw and SmackDown goes. So, I, I don't understand that logic. I don't understand that logic. So, you don't want Triple H to fail. So, do everything to give him leeway to not fail. I don't think Triple H would fail if he has full creative control over Monday Night Raw or SmackDown Live. I don't think he would. So, why would you automatically deem him to fail if he took over said role? So, what are you saying about Eric Bischoff and Paul Heyman? Are you setting the, the bar so low? Are you setting the expectations so low as to you knowing that they will fail? The only reason why Eric Bischoff and Paul Heyman will fail is if they don't have creative control over what they need to do. The only reason why Eric Bischoff and Paul Heyman will fail is if Vince McMahon continues to be a fucking pest. That's the only reason why they'll fail. People will fail because of Vince McMahon's influence. And we know the shows are failing now because of Vince McMahon. So I don't get that. Why would you automatically deem your son-in-law a failure or afraid of him failing when we know he wouldn't if you had nothing to do with it? I don't get that. And I don't like the fact that you're already setting the bar so low for, for Bischoff and Heyman on Raw and SmackDown. It doesn't sound like Vince McMahon is all that confident in Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff. Shouldn't even mention Triple H. Shouldn't even mention why Triple H didn't get it. 
should have just stuck with the fact that Triple H kindly turned it down because he values NXT far too much right now, and I would have been okay with that excuse. But now here we are, it's kind of a half-assed response as to why Triple H didn't take over Monday Night Raw or SmackDown Live as executive director. I don't like that whatsoever. Paul Heyman had nothing to do with major storyline on Raw. Talked about this in the open. Going to dive a little bit deeper into this. The Wrestling Observer Newsletter reports that Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows joining up with AJ Styles once again and causing the phenomenal one, AJ Styles' heel turn, had nothing to do with Paul Heyman. Look at that, folks. You got excited about something that happened three years too late. And in fact, it wasn't even a Paul Heyman decision. In fact, it was already in the works. You've seen it happening on television. This was already in the works before he was put into power backstage. Now, Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson are given the option of signing new deals. They had their contracts given to them. They either sign them or they walk away. It was told to Dave Meltzer that they are now both long-term with WWE. In fact, they will be focused on with the new club and the new pairing of AJ Styles. This and the Styles heel turn were said to be written out before Heyman was given power, says Dave Meltzer. Paul Heyman will undoubtedly have a lot of fun booking a heel AJ Styles, but this came about in the creative picture because it was already set in motion. Therefore, WWE's plan was to turn Styles heel and reunite with the club with or without Paul Heyman as the executive director of Monday Night Raw. I'm going to be interested to see now that this plan was already in motion how Paul Heyman books them from here on out. I think Paul Heyman could really bring this to be a really fun angle. That remains to be seen, given how much power he does have over Monday Night Raw with Vince McMahon still sitting there. But... You know, I mentioned this being three years too late, and it is three years too late. I-, I booked this scenario time and time and time again. I would have never had AJ Styles debut in the Royal Rumble. I would have never had Styles debut in the Royal Rumble because a guy like that, you know, you really can't base it off the fact, oh, he's not going to be known in front of the WWE audience. He got one of the biggest reactions that night. The Royal Rumble is a mark crowd. Everybody knows who everybody is. You're there because you love the fucking sport. Of pro wrestling. So clearly they knew who AJ Styles was. They popped big for him. I'm not going to put someone the caliber of AJ Styles in the Royal Rumble and not have him win. I would have never debuted him in the Royal Rumble. I would have debuted AJ Styles on the Monday night after WrestleMania. That was the same year that Roman Reigns battled Triple H in a god-awful main event at WrestleMania 32, won the title. And I honestly think that with The Shield still viable at that point, I would have had AJ Styles crash the party very Bullet Club style, and built the Shield and the club all through that year. You would have really brought AJ Styles and Gallows and Anderson to top-tier heights in WWE. They would have been solidified as a threat. They would have come in and staked the claim and set their invasion in motion, challenging the WWE champion right out of the gate. They conquered Japan. Now they're conquering the United States. It was fucking... It was so simple. It was so just easy to book, and it would have been great. Survivor Series could have added so much drama to it with the fucking club and the Shield. Who's going to take over WWE? The Shield is fighting for justice. It would have been great. It would have been great. And WWE split them up in the draft. AJ Styles went to SmackDown. Gallows and Anderson died over the next three years. This is why people don't understand when I say three years too late. They got John Cena in a program with AJ Styles. They put AJ against Roman Reigns, and that was it. They cared more about AJ and solidifying AJ's position in WWE than they did Gallows and Anderson. So now Gallows and Anderson have been dead for three years, and the only reason why you want to keep them is to keep them from going to AEW. There's a point where WWE took them off the road because of the fact they didn't sign new deals, so they had them sit at home collecting paychecks until their contracts expired. Now you want to use them. How much of that hinders on AEW? How, how much of that hinders on the incoming war with All Elite Wrestling and WWE as we get into October? A lot of it. I honestly think the only reason why Gallows and Anderson are now paired with Styles and now they're being focused on is because WWE knows that if talent is unhappy, they are going to leave. So WWE is manipulating talent 
to stay with the company by doing what they should have done in the past just to simply keep them from going somewhere else. Just look at Mike Kanellis. Mike Kanellis signed for five years. He thought he was going to be a factor on 205 Live. They had him emasculated on Monday Night Raw and he was called a bitch by his wife. His manhood was fucking taken from him. I'm not even sure you're man enough to get me pregnant. Who wants to hear that shit? Nobody wants to see that shit. You just made Mike Kanellis into a cuck on live television. It's a great job there. You signed for five years, you took the money, now you're a fucking loser on television in the eyes of every fucking woman out there watching this program. And every guy watching this program because you have no value to anybody. Gallows and Anderson should have a lot of value for themselves. They are suckers if they take a WWE deal. For three years, you were wasted. All because WWE now is pairing you with AJ Styles, you think you're going to have some sort of direction on this show? Are we going to get classic matches with Gallows and Anderson, with the Usos and the Revival? Are you going to be a solid tag team that gives us what we've seen from you in New Japan and in WWE? The answer is no. If Gallows and Anderson think WWE is going to book them in a meaningful way just because they paired them with AJ Styles and just because you potentially signed a new deal, which we don't know that they did yet, you're a fool. You're a fool. Gallows and Anderson, in this case, are cucks because they strip all of their pride to stay with the WWE for more money instead of finding more value in yourself and being a part of the best tag team division in the fucking sport right now in all elite wrestling. You'd rather be mediocre in WWE with a huge question mark on your fucking careers for the next five years instead of going to AEW where you know everybody, where you know you will be treated with respect and you will be given the platform as a tag team to be fucking respected. I don't get it. I really don't understand it. For months, 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 we've seen these guys disgruntled, and all because they pair them with AJ Styles and are given new deals and X amount of money for those deals, now it's okay to stay. I guess the three years that you went through doing nothing were for what? They were all for nothing. You look back at that and you find that to be something of a time you could look back on and see that you advanced as not only individuals but performers. If WWE wasted you for three years, who's to say they're not going to waste you for the next five years? I don't trust this company. I wouldn't trust this company if I were them. Which makes this decision all that much more baffling. I don't get it, man. I know if I'm them, I'm going somewhere else because of the way I was treated. You can only take so much... And there's no way you can trust this company with what they're doing now. They're doing it sheer, out of sheer desperation, and they're doing it merely because they don't want you to go anywhere else. I don't know why they can't see that. Paul Heyman's on-screen role for WWE Raw moving forward. I mentioned this in the first video that I did on this shit. They should not be. Bischoff and Heyman should not be on these shows as... GMs, or they should not have a focus as new executive directors. They should not have a play on themselves on the show. I wouldn't do it immediately. I would not. I, I wouldn't sit here and not have Bischoff on TV. I would put Bischoff in a position of using him the same way NXT uses William Regal. You don't see William Regal at all, really, on NXT television. Only is there to make a match, or if something is really detrimental to the overall fucking show. He's got to come in and throw his power around. That's when you use him. Heyman's going to be on t TV anyway because he's the advocate for Brock Lesnar. We all know that. But Eric Bischoff, his character, in my eyes, outweighs what he does creatively. I think Eric Bischoff is one of the greatest GMs that Monday Night Raw has ever seen. I think Eric Bischoff as a character is fucking great because he owns the camera. He's a prick. He's a great character in a position of power. So I would assume that we would see Eric Bischoff on TV sooner rather than later. I, I wouldn't make them a focus of these shows. That's what needs to be done. I hope they realize that. They don't need to be a focus. The shows don't need to be built around them. It's the talent first. You write for the talent. You take a backseat. They're the star, not you. Heyman is backstage at Raw most weeks anyway. He's not only doing his deal with Brock Lesnar, but he also helps out a lot of superstars with their characters backstage. He's been known to work with AJ Styles. He is most recently in the news about working with Aleister Black, Alexa Bliss, Ronda Rousey, so on and so forth. He's helped Roman Reigns, 
So clearly, he's not only helped some of the talent backstage, but the talent has huge respect for what Paul Heyman brings to the table. Due to Heyman's new role as executive director of Raw, he has a lot more influence backstage. A ton of things were, to some, noticeably different, possibly more in a backstage capacity. Dave Meltzer discussed the idea that Paul Heyman is going to do away with the authority figure roles as part of his new position on Raw during Wrestling Observer Radio. We went into detail on the on-screen role that Heyman will continue to have. Heyman was on the show, which was really just a segment to get the Street Profits over. He is still going to do promos. The character of the advocate of Paul Heyman and Brock Lesnar is still going to be there. That's going to stay the same. I love that. I absolutely love that. Paul Heyman wants to do away with authority figures. Meltzer also expanded on just doing away with this moving forward. Meltzer briefly opened up during Wrestling Observer Live on the authority figure role. He says, and I quote, one thing they're going to do at least is not have a heel authority figure and no authority figure at all. During the entire time, there was no mention of Paul Heyman. No mention of Paul Heyman on this show. There was a very different, very light, you know, I guess feel as to that there was change. There was the explosions at the start of the show. There was a light thank you Paul chant after that, or a thank you Heyman chant. This is awesome. Thank you, Heyman. I don't think WWE needs to make mention of this at all. Uh, if they do, it needs to be very light, like I said. And with Bischoff and Heyman, it needs to go in a way of them being the William Regal. Again, talent first, them seconds. You are writing and booking for the talent. You are playing the bench role in this position. The talent needs to be first and foremost, up front and center. Paul Heyman, along with all this, wanting to do away with authority figures and his on-screen role, him himself, his on-screen role. This is great. Paul Heyman wants to focus on long-term storylines moving forward. Inside the Ropes recently uploaded a clip of Paul Heyman during their recent Q&A mini tour. In this clip, Heyman discussed how he wants to focus on long-term stories in pro wrestling. He took place, or he took his place of appointment as, as executive director on Raw. That was made official. But it should give fans an idea as to where Heyman stands on this topic. He says, and I quote, I want to know where I'm going. I never written the first page of a story and then figured it out along the way. I always write the end first. It's just my training and it's just the way I see things. Here's the finish. Here's what we got to do going into next year's WrestleMania. Here's how we close WrestleMania. Now, how do we get there? End quote. I love it. I think that's great. You have to have a focus on where you want to go. This is the problem in WWE right now. They always book for week to week. They don't have an end game in place. You see it. How many times does a storyline take place and you don't have a definitive end? Sometimes it's dropped altogether. Sometimes the end comes and it's not what we expected it to be. And WWE just continues and continues and continues said storyline. And there's no end. It just continues to roll on. And by that time, it's just dropped. I love the fact that Paul Heyman wants to, you know, bring this forth as far as a creative aspect. How do we get to where we want to go? How do we end it? What do you see as far as an ending to this? You know, it's exactly what happened with Becky Lynch and Ronda Rousey and Charlotte. Becky Lynch is going to win the title at WrestleMania. She's going to pin Ronda Rousey. How do we get there? We got the end. We got the beginning. Now, let's write out the middle. How are we going to get there? I love that. Instead of this week-to-week shit where we don't know where WWE's going with this, most of us just assume and book on the fly here, book in our own fantasy creative world here on what WWE is doing, there needs to be an end result here. With AJ Styles and the club getting together, is it going to lead to another addition to the group? What is them getting back together going to do for Gallows Anderson and AJ Styles? What is the reason for them getting back together? You got to give me the why. You got to give me the why here. What is their long-term plan? Are you planning on feuding them with the New Day? Are they going to be the one group that you look forward to and look towards taking over WWE television? Are you going to do an invasion storyline? Are you going to bring up the Undisputed Era and feud them with a four-piece on the main roster? I don't know in the form of the club. I don't know. I don't know. You have to have an end goal. What's the end goal of Brock Lesnar in the Money in the Bank briefcase? 
Did WWE have an end goal by giving Brock Lesnar the briefcase, or did they just do it to pop a fucking rating on the next night on Monday Night Raw? That's exactly what they did. They didn't have any plans for Brock Lesnar and the Money in the Bank briefcase. If they did, then it would have been instituted by now. They have no fucking plan for Brock Lesnar. All this tease and all this boom Bach Brock's and, you know, Brock Lesnar's going to show up on Friday at, uh, at Super Show. They didn't have any plans. They booked on a week-to-week basis. Brock's got to be there. He's got to make an appearance. So he shows up, no cash in. Brock's going to show up on Monday. He's a cash in during the main event. No cash in. It's ridiculous. There's no plan in place. That's WWE booking week-to-week television. Instead of giving someone like Mustafa Ali the briefcase, who was going to win the match anyway, and then WWE decided on Brock Lesnar, Mustafa Ali wins the briefcase. Survivor Series is in Chicago. He cashes in the briefcase in Chicago, which is coincidentally his hometown. Gets the big pop, gets the big hometown crowd, the big hometown celebration. He's the new WWE champion in November at Survivor Series. That's an end goal. The WWE decided to give Brock the title, or the briefcase rather, in chase of the title, to merely pop a rating and merely to get social media traction as far as, oh, look at what we did. It didn't make any sense, but Brock Lesnar's the new Money in the Bank briefcase holder. That's why they did it. I love that Heyman wants to focus on long-term storytelling because that is what all creative writing should do. And I hope that it is a breath of fresh air to all the writers that Paul Heyman is sitting around with, giving them what the end goal should be. Get me there. How are we going to get there? I love it. And you could easily tell when this is going to be in place. Instead of the week-to-week that we normally feel every single week, I hope to see long st- long-term long storytelling because once that is in effect, you will see it, you will feel it. I can't wait to see what he does. Again, he had really no fingerprints on any of this show on Monday night, which I so just put out there in the open of the show. He had nothing to do with that show. Nothing. It was all shit that was already in motion. And he's not really going to have his DNA on the show until probably after Extreme Rules or, I would say, the latest by SummerSlam season. He didn't have nothing to do with Monday Night Raw. He had a glimpse here and there, but nothing to do with Paul Heyman. Long-term storytelling is key. Now, before we get out of here, because I got news as well for Saturday. I want to save the rest of what I got for Saturday before we get out of here. What role did Paul Heyman officially play this week in his new position on Raw? What did he influence on this show? I'm not saying that Paul Heyman didn't have anything to do with the show, but he didn't have anything creatively to do with the show. And this is why people shit on me, because Paul Heyman's name was attached to Monday Night Raw. People shit all over the show. Oh, I shit all over the show, and then people shit all over me. The Paul Heyman era, I guess you can kind of say that this was his first show. Raw seemed to include several interesting segments that were not of typical WWE programming, and the show had a very interesting feel around it. But how involved was Heyman in this week's show? Wade Keller noted on the PW Torch's post-Raw show that Paul Heyman was helping helping to conduct Monday Night Raw in guerrilla position for the entire broadcast. So he was the maestro of the show. He was right next to Vince McMahon, where there was no sign of any animosity There was no sign of anyone stepping on each other's toes, and everybody got along quite well. In fact, the atmosphere, says Wade Keller, was said to be one of cohesiveness instead of conflict. Essentially, they were all able to tell Vince McMahon stories with some Paul Heyman influence on what they said verbally. Dave Meltzer discussed Paul Heyman's apparent influence on WWE's product this week on the Wrestling Observer Radio. As it was previously noted, there was some differences between this week's show and last week's show as far as feel. It was the same show, visually, but there was really nothing outside the Street Profits and maybe, I would say, the Braun Strowman and Bobby Lashley explosion, which was really nothing out of the ordinary anyway. Paul Heyman was backstage... His fingerprints were seen on this show in in different parts. I would say that you could call this his first show. His fingerprints were definitely on this show. I'd say most of the stuff, you know, that we've seen with the Braun Strowman and Bobby Lashley and the feel of the show went through him. I know they had a big production meeting. The people still talk about the show uh, were Vince and Ed Kosky and not Paul, but there was some Paul stuff in this show. 
but mostly he sat in Gorilla with Vince working on the entire flow of the show. That was pretty much it. What role did he play? He didn't have any role at all. He didn't have a say in storylines as WWE is finishing up storylines. He didn't really have... You know, anything to do with where they're going into Extreme Rules. This is why I mentioned with Extreme Rules coming up, Eric Bischoff and Paul Heyman are definitely going to be felt, I think, more so after Extreme Rules. That's when we can really gauge on what they're doing. And it all hinders on if Vince McMahon is going to let him do and let Eric Bischoff do what they need to do. I I don't think that's going to be the case. I really don't. I really do not think that is going to be the case Because Vince McMahon and his XFL commitments are becoming a problem for WWE creative. Sports Illustrated is reporting that Vince McMahon could be so immersed with the XFL that there will be no opportunity for Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff to even get a chance to speak with him. This could become a problem. Therefore, things might not change at all in regards to Vince McMahon's control over Raw and SmackDown Live because Heyman and Bischoff might not have a chance to add what they want to add to the show with Vince being such a control freak and him doing XFL things and not being at the shows, he might want the shows to go in his way anyway and he might override everything that Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff institute on Monday and Tuesday nights. Many see McMahon's impending uh, creative process and consistency, but multiple sources have shared the belief that McMahon will be so immersed in his work with the XFL that this is going to be A rare opportunity for Heyman and Bischoff. It's not going to be a situation where they're going to have a chance to talk to Vince McMahon. So it can either work out one of two ways. Vince McMahon is going to have 100% control of what happens with the show. And Eric Bischoff and Paul Heyman, like I mentioned last week, are going to take the heat for Vince McMahon. Or, or, this could lead to Heyman and Bischoff putting their fingerprints completely on Monday Night Raw without Vince McMahon being that he's going to be so involved with the XFL. Again, only time will tell how things pan out. Raw has some some things that could be looked at as positive, but right not right now in my eyes. And Vince McMahon's work ethic could prove to be a hindrance. With him leading the XFL and not wanting to concede control of Monday Night Raw, it could actually work out that no change is ever seen on this show. Because if Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff were noted as directly speaking to Vince McMahon and directly reporting to Vince McMahon, how could they report to somebody that's not there? How could you physically give your okay on everything that these guys want to do if you're not there and your attention is somewhere else? You can't split your attention between WWE and the XFL. This is so important to Vince McMahon that he wants to get the XFL started. So to see it happen the way you want, Maybe you should direct your attention to that and that only. And the reason why you hire these guys is to change your shows going into October. And the only way we're going to see change is with Vince McMahon 100% out of the picture. The only way we're going to see change is Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff having 100% creative control. Them making these shows theirs. I, I hope this isn't the case. And this is coming directly from Sports Illustrated. So, I don't know what's going to happen. It's either going to be all the way on McMahon... Or it's going to be all the way on Bischoff and I don't see, or and Heyman. And I don't see that happening going all the way on Bischoff and all the way on Heyman at all. You guys better be worried. I fully believe in this story by Sports Illustrated. I don't see Vince McMahon giving up any control. If he's with the XFL, he's still going to want to have his say in the show. And if he's not there and he doesn't know what's going on, he's going to want to have the shows appeal to him still even with Heyman and Bischoff in charge. And it's going to go right back to what I stated. They're just there as puppets. They're there as a meat shield because now when we are frustrated with the shows, McMahon is going to be out of the picture. Our frustrations are going to be geared towards Bischoff and Heyman. And that could be the only reason why these guys were hired. I hope not. Because I deserve, we deserve, you deserve, the community deserves a better show. And we, after all these years, seeing Monday Night Raw suffer so long, I would love to see the shows in the hands of somebody else. New eyes, new idea, new vision, because this show desperately needs it. I'm getting out of here, guys. Thank you so very much for all your support on Off The Script this weekend. If you did enjoy the video, please hit that thumbs up down below. Follow me on social media, at JD from NY206. That's both on Twitter and Instagram. 
hit that subscribe button, turn on that bell for all notifications, join the channel if you guys want to do so, patreon.com slash jdfromny206. Make sure you guys check out all this week's videos, Raw, SmackDown, NXT. If you missed Fighter Fest and the review for Fighter Fest AEW, it's on the channel. If you missed Off the Script last weekend, that is there as well. And harrys.com slash script. Make sure you guys go get your $13 value trial set by using our unique link, harrys.com slash script. I'm getting out of you guys. Hit that thumbs up and I'll see you back here on Saturday for more Off the Script. What we got lined up for tomorrow, we got plenty of news. I got news on The Undertaker and Sting once again being majorly teased for WWE. I mentioned this. I would not be surprised to see that at the next Saudi show. Major superstars to get big pushes on Monday Night Raw due to the influence of Paul Heyman, WWE, and them bringing in Eric Bischoff. What is the backstage reaction in the WWE locker room? Dolph Ziggler back full time. What does Kevin Owens' face turn mean? on SmackDown Live. Who's running 205 Live? And why hasn't Finn Balor wrestled in two months on SmackDown Live? All that coming up on Saturday's episode of 281, part number two. Thank you guys so very much. Hope you had a great fourth. I'll see you back here on Saturday for more news and rumors. Until then, enjoy your Fridays. I'll see you right back here on Saturday for more Off the Script. See you guys later.